Uh, let me uh, introduce the Professor Patrice Simon. The Professor Simon is a distinguished professor of the material science at the University Paul Sabatier. Then Professor Simon is a deputy director of the French Network on Electrochemical, the Energy Storage. Then he is a member of the French Academy of Science since 2019. Then he received many the award. Then also he is serving as a co-editor in chief of Energy Storage Materials. Uh, please welcome the Professor Simon. Thanks a lot for a very kind introduction. And uh, I would like to uh, thank you all for uh, attending this uh, conference, despite uh, this got to be late in the afternoon in Korea. So this is my great pleasure and honor to speak uh, about electrochemistry under confinement in 2D materials for energy storage applications. And obviously, as I just uh, going to take the lead after Yuri, Professor Godotsi, I was having talk on Maxime. I will try to talk also a little bit, I modified somehow a little bit my talk, and I will try to put as well a few things about carbon materials for uh, capacitive energy storage, then I will move to Maxine's. So as you mentioned before, uh, this is a, a Ragoni plot where you show a specific power versus energy of, uh, or ener yeah, power versus energy for different uh, energy storage devices. And basically we want to reach this goal with high energy, high power, uh, for electrochemical devices. One way to do that is to start from electrochemical capacitors and then to increase the energy density, still maintaining high power for these devices. And all the work about that uh, is dedicated to a better understanding of the ion transfer, ion adsorption in the nano-sized pores of porous carbons. And I will give you examples of what we are recently, recently have done on, the, on this topic. The second way to reach, again, this uh, yellow target is to increase the power densities of batteries. And this is a very nice uh, uh, complement to what Yuri just introduced, uh, just talked about, Maxine. And what we try to do is to use redox materials, but we try to modify a little bit these redox materials by designing non-diffusion limited redox reactions so that you can increase the energy density still in house, keep the high energy density three and increasing the power. So I will start by electrical double layers. So uh, supercapacitors. So as you may know, supercapacitors, they are high power energy storage devices. And the charge storage mechanism is only based on electrostatic uh, storage by ion adsorption onto high surface area carbon nanoporous carbons, I would say. And what you do is that there is no redox reaction. The, the electrode material here is only porous carbon. So this is a modeling representation of uh, a porous carbon electrode, the electrolyte, and the second porous carbon electrode. And you can see that when you polarize the system, when you have you inject, uh, when you inject positive charge onto a carbon, then Anions on the electrolyte will go into the positive electrode. And this is what you see here. All these anions are going inside the pores and adsorbed into nanopores. And by doing that, there is no redox reaction. You just charge a double layer capacitance. And this double layer capacitance is proportional to the uh, dielectric constant of the electrolyte. And uh, varies with the uh, reverse of approaching distance of the ion to the carbon surface. When you have super high surface area, then you can use, we can reach high gravimetric capacitance for carbon when you use 1500 square meter per, uh, 1500 meter per gram carbon. So the challenge here is to really get a better understanding of the electrochemical, electrical double layer charging in confined pores. And this is a sketch I show you here. This is the, uh, I would say the gray atoms are carbon and here, the red one is a cation, the blue one is a solvent. So here, this is a negative electrode. And you can see that you have a nanopore of carbon of about 0.7 nanometer. And ions are entering, cations are entering into these pores of the negative electrode with a partial desolvation. They lose a part of their solvation shell and they can have access to these pores. And here, the same situation for an anion, PF6 minus anion. You see this anion is going inside the pores with a little bit more solvent, but still you have this desolvation phenomenon because the pores are smaller than the size of a solvated ion. And then this partial ion desolvation leads to capacitance increase. And now, to uh, this is what we what we propose with Yuri uh, 
years ago. But now what you need is to try to better understand ion adsorption and ion transfer inside these nanopores. And this is why we <clears throat> use a, a, an advanced electrochemical technique, which is called electrochemical quark crystal microbalance. But uh, I will say porous 3D carbon is a bit tricky to study. We did a lot of work on EQCM and porous carbons, and we decided to make a little bit a step back to try to understand the double layer formation model methane on 2D carbon electrode on single graphene layer. So how we do that, you take, you grow a single layer graphene onto a, a copper from CVD, then you etch the copper and <clears throat> you recover your, 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 you transfer your uh, single layer graphene onto PET fin. And then by transfer, you press your PET fin onto a gold quartz, piezoelectric quartz, and you remove the PET fin and you end up with a gold quartz, piezoelectric quartz, coated with a single layer graphene. And this gold quartz is going to be used as a working electrode in a free electrode cell to run electrochemistry measurements. You have a gold quartz coated with a, a single layer graphene, graphene layer, and then you put it in a electrolyte and then you are going to make electrochemistry on it. And what is interesting, exactly like a QCM, is that your quartz has a resonance frequency and as long as the weight change in your uh, electrode is going to change, the weight of your electrode is going to change, you will end up with a change in the, uh, uh, the resonance frequency. And you can convert the change of the frequency into a mass, a weight change. And by using the Faraday's law, you can <coughs> calculate uh, the charge passed during the your electrochemical process. And if you plot the weight change of the electrode from the frequency change versus the charge, you have you end up with a molar weight of the charge which is absorbed onto your electrode. And this is um, what we did. We we uh, used uh, uh, we took a gold quartz and we deposit, as I mentioned, a single graphene layer. Uh, SGL, and then what you see here, optical uh, observation, you have some slight and coated and covered gold quartz zones, but it's very really minor, about 80% of the gold quartz is coated. Raman spectra is typical for, uh, I would say, a p uh, graphene, and then you have some wrinkles, but this is very minor on the, on the electrode. Then what you did was to make a cyclic voltammetry to use this uh, SG coated quartz uh, single graphene layer quartz uh, in uh, an electrolyte. The electrolyte is ethyl, um, ethyl methyl imidazodium TFSI uh, salt, which is ionic liquid uh, with no solvent in the first step. And this is a cyclic voltammetry in black of a red of a go of neat quartz and in red of a quartz coated with SLG. So as you can see, your cyclic voltammetry is typically from, uh, shows a typical uh, feature of a capacitive double layer, there is no redox speed. So we, in red, we uh, recovered the electrochemical signature of a single layer graphene. Now what we did, we have polarized this electrode at constant potentials, and we have measured the double layer capacitance. Uh, just to try to get uh, 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 to plot the change of a double layer capacitance versus a potential. And this was done by using electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. And this is the change of a double layer capacitance of a single layer graphene versus the potential of uh, the graphene. So as you can see, you, we have a V-shape capacitance change, what was called in the literature butterfly shape. This shape was explained from several by uh, what were several explanations was proposed were proposed in the literature to explain this shape. The first one is the change of electrical conductivity of a carbon. So we uh, here the minimum corresponds of the minimum conductivity of the single layer graphene. The second one was proposed with. Uh, uh, the influence of a quantum capacitance. Basically, you have a small amount of charge carrier density of a single layer graphene. And then what you can see here is this minimum corresponds to the uh, limitation from the charge carrier density side of the SLG. So everything was, these two hypotheses deal with limitation from the carbon side. However, there are other limitations which can, be exp which can explain this shape coming from the electrolyte. Ion interactions between the electrolyte and uh, the interactions between the electrolyte ions and the uh, carbon. So to try to understand whether it comes from carbon or the electrolyte or both, we did some electrochemical quark crystal microbalance study 
of that. And this is here, the CV, the same I showed you before in uh, EMI TFSI electrolyte. And here you see the change of resonance frequency of the quartz during the cyclic voltammetry. As I mentioned to you, <clears throat> we, you can convert the change of frequency, res resonance frequency into a change of weight. You can integrate the area under the CV to get the charge, and you can plot the change of a char of a weight, electrode weight, versus the charge. And you have this plot. Here, this is a PCC. And what you can see is that for positive polarization here, you only have a weight loss from the electrode. It means that you inject positive charges, you dissolve something, and you dissolve a positive charge. And this positive charge, based on the molar weight we can calculate from the slope, was estimated to be a cluster, a positive cluster of EMI 1.58, TFSI 0.58 plus. And this big ion cluster is typically uh, can typically be observed in neat ionic liquid where you don't have any solvent to screen the charges between the ions. So first here, weight change during positive polarization. What happens during negative polarization, negative Q? As you can see, there is no weight change on the electrode. So there is no net ion fluxes from the electrode or to the electrode. However, remember that we still have a capacitive charge story. We still charge a double layer. And this is really interesting, and it was an unexpect, unexpected result. And what you can, what we did by modeling, what we understood is that here, when you go to negative polarization, you have cations which are absorbed onto the onto the uh, surface of the SFG. And the more you polarize, cations are the PCC are absorbed vertically, EMI EMI cations. And the more you polarize, the more the cations tends to be. Uh, tends to align parallel to the graphene surface. And this is just a charge storage mechanism by electrolyte ion reorganization at the surface of the graphene. So this was a very interesting result showing, yeah, yes, you can charge, you can have charge storage just by electrolyte reorganization. And these results are interesting because it offers uh, a, a way to study the influence of electrolyte composition and so on. And then this is what we did in the next step we uh, uh, still use a single graphene layer uh, coated onto a, a quartz of the EQCM. But now, instead of using EMI TFSI, we added a solvent, acetonitrile CH3CN. And we study the influence of the presence of a solvent. This is here, the same uh, double layer capacitance change versus the potential of the electrode. This was a previous one observed for EMI TFSI in it. And this is what you observe now when you add solvent acetonitrile, you use a two mole per liter EMI TFSI in acetonitrile. The first thing that you see is that you have a shift of a PCC to positive potentials. You see here the PCC is there and it was here. And this is explained by a decrease. You mentioned, I mentioned to you before that uh, cations were in strong interaction with the carbon surface because of the pi pi interactions, for instance, when you add solvent, then what you do is that you screen the charge, you screen uh, the charges between uh, uh, the ions and you decrease the interactions between the cation and the graphene surface so that the PCC is increased. This is a nice confirmation. And if you take the double layer cha capacitance change of gold, the gold quartz, the bare gold quartz, the double layer is constant. And then what we did, try to go a little bit further, we did a much shorter analysis of this single layer graphene ionic liquid interface. So uh, the interfacial capacitance is the sum of a space charge capacitance, as we can call, and the double layer capacitance, space charge from graphene and double layer from uh, uh, the, mat the material of the, the, the gold. As we saw before, this double layer capacitance is constant. The gold capacitance is flat with a potential. And the space charge capacitance is given by uh, uh, the Mozart K equation, one divided by C squared is proportional to the uh, to the delta V, V and VB being the potential of a, of a flat down potential. It's proportional to the increase of the potential versus the flat down potential. And then you can plot, if you take the derivative of this expression, you can, you can say that the derivative of the interface, uh, one divided by C interface, is in fact the derivative of one divided by CSC, the space charge capacitance, because double layer capacitance is constant. And then you can plot one divided by C square, the derivative one divided by C square versus the uh, V minus VFB or E minus EPCC. And what you see here 
This is the plot for NIT EMI TFSI, and this is the plot for EMI TFSI in acetonitrile. When you have a single layer graphene uh, in contact with this EMI TFSI based electrolyte, you move from N type to P type uh, behavior when you cross the PCC. This is the first information. However, what is a space charge capacitance on a single layer graphene? It seems to be meaningless because it's a monolayer, single layer of graphene. However, Remember, if we consider that we have uh, cations, EMI plus cations, in strong interaction or in interactions with a graphene surface, it means that we can propose a kind of gram-like double layer model with specifically adsorbed ions. And this space charge capacitance can be defined as the, uh, the capacitance within this volume, taking into account the volume of a cations specifically adsorbed in strong interaction with graphene. So in fact, this space charge capacitance depends on both the single layer graphene and the electrolyte. And if you do a kind of analysis, the charge carrier density, we found a charge carrier density of 10 to power 23 uh, per cubic centimeter uh, in neat ionic liquids for both polarization, which is given by the slope here. And if you consider uh, a Dubai length of one nanometer means that if you consider that you have a, uh, your, your charge separation, including the strongly, specific, uh, strongly adsorbed cation is one nanometer, then you end up with 10 to 14 uh, charge carrier per square centimeter, which is super in line with previously reported results. And what is interesting is that you have similar uh, doping level, similar charge carrier le level on both sides of the plot in EMI TFSI in acetonitrile, acetonitrile here for the positive polarization. However, if you move to negative polarization here, you can see a big difference between the charge care density in solvated and non-solvated, uh, I would say, electrolyte. And this is explained in when you add acetonitrile, you decrease the, the by length because of no other screening and less cation interactions with the, with the surface of the graphene and you increase the charge care density. So that what is super important to understand is that the space charge capacitance and the capacitance of a single layer graphene depends on both the graphene, the, 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 the graphene and the electrolyte. And if you do a graphimetric analysis, like I mentioned before, weight chain versus Q, then what you can see is that on both sides, you see that you have counter ion adsorption. If you inject negative charge, this is balanced by adsorption of cations. You inject positive charge, this is balanced with adsorption of anions. And you can see that both of these ions are more or less, uh, I would say, uh, partially desolvated because one cation adsorbs with only one single solvent molecules. One anion adsorbs with two acetonitrile molecules. This can be ca easily calculated from the weight, molar weight of the anion and the more experimental molar weight here. So this is a parcel dissolution. And if you compare what you obtain between, I will say, EMI TFSI in acetonitrile here and single layer graphene in neat EMI TFSI, you can see that the presence of solvent changes a lot the charge storage mechanism, just because you screen the pi pi interactions, which exist between the sp2 carbon of the graphene and the EMI plus cation. And this is even worse. If you compare in two mole per liter EMI TFSI, a single layer graphene and a porous carbon of one nanometer where you have confinement effect of the ion. You can see here that you have for porous carbon, you have a huge ion exchange mechanism here. And this corresponds, this region that you don't observe here, corresponds to a specific interactions of cations with a graphene, oh, sorry, with a carbon surface uh, inside the pores. And before absorbing an ion, you remove cations. And as you can see, we, there is no clear explanation why in the confined pores, uh, cations uh, in the solvated ionic liquids are strongly adsorbed into a porous carbon. But this clearly shows that not only the pore size is important for uh, capacitive energy storage for supercapacitors, but also the local carbon structure and the presence of sp2 carbon is very important as well. So my second part of the talk will be dedicated to try to explain how to increase the power density of batteries to still increase, uh, still reach this high power, high energy uh, uh, zone of the Ragoni plot. So Yuri, 
made a very uh, outstanding uh, talk regarding Maxime. Just, I'm going to uh, uh, recall uh, some very basics. So obviously these vaccines were discovered by uh, Professor Yui Gagotsis uh, uh, in 2011 uh, at Drexel University with Michel Barzon group. And basically how you produce, you prepare vaccines, you start from max precursor, example TI3LC2, and you are going to etch this max precursor in fluoride containing electrolyte, like a mixture of LIF plus HCl. And by doing that, you etch the A layer and you prepare for instance, here, TI3C2 mixings. Obviously, because of the etching preparation, your TI3C2 mixing contains surface groups. And these surface groups uh, is driven by the etching electrolyte. Here, most of the mixings contain fluorine and OH minus groups because of the etching in uh, fluorine containing aqueous electrolyte. As you mentioned before, the beauty of these mixings, they are super high, uh, they have super high electrical conductivity and they have a transition metal, titanium in this case, and you can store energy by, the ch by changing the redox state of a titanium. This is what we did uh, a couple of years ago, a few <laughs> more than a couple of years ago, 2013. Uh, we, uh, uh, we did study the electrochemical behavior of max muxine TR3C2 in sulfuric acid electrolyte. And what you can see is that if you polarize your TF3C2 mixine in sulfuric acid electrolyte, if you inject electrons, then you are going to intercalate cations, and this cation intercalation together with electron in injection results in the change of the oxidation state of the titanium. And you end up with a very fast proton intercalation, a change of titanium redox state, and then you end up with a redox reaction with no diffusion limitation within these two distillates. However, uh, these materials are mainly uh, produced from fluorine containing etching, electrolyte etching. And we know that muxine reactivity depends on the surface composition. So the question is, is it possible to prepare muxines with different surface groups. In other way, it's very way to develop new synthesis method that can tune that you that you can use to tune the surface chemistry of mixing. So we did a collaboration with a, a group at Nimbo from uh, Professor Ching Huang to develop a new synthesis route for mixing from molten salt. So you take basically a copper chloride that you heat at 750 Celsius degrees. So it's a mixture of copper chloride as an etching salt and a supporting electrolyte, which is a, a, a potassium nitrate and a sodium nitrate and lithium nitrate. So, and then what you do during this reaction, copper to plus ions from this Lewis acid are going to be reduced and oxidize the A element, which is here the silicon from the max TI3SIC2 phase. So you reduce copper to plus and to copper, you oxidize silicon into silicon four plus, and then you end up with muxine, the muxine phase. And this is what you what is written here. However, here you can see that you here uh, reduce copper onto the surface of the muxine, uh, sorry, here. <laughs> and then what you need is to oxidize this copper here presents by washing with ammonium persulfate. And after washing, what you can do, what you can see is that you see very nice lamellar TR3C2. The XRD pattern tells you that yes, you move from max phase to here, the 0020040L uh, layers of, uh, 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 I would say, a muxine, there is a mistake here, there is no silicon, uh, with, uh, I would say, uh, copper onto it. And here, after washing with APS, there is no more uh, copper, and you end up only with uh, zero, zero L layer peaks uh, of the mixing. And ICP and elemental analysis confirm that we prepared oxygen and chlor sorry, chlorine CL terminated mixing. The composition is TI3, C1.94, O1.7, CL0.75 mixing. So it's a fluorine free mixing, only chlorine terminated. And this method can be generalized because you play with the Gibbs energy uh, for the reaction between the, uh, I would say, the Lewis acid uh, etchant and the potential redox, redox potential of A element. And you can prepare all this composition in, in, uh, in uh, I would say, uh, uh, blue color. 
And we show that you could prepare a lot of different uh, vaccines from this method just by tuning the redox potentials of, uh, of, uh, of the mix. Now we did some uh, thermal desorption, program desorption, mass, spectros, mass uh, spectrometry analysis of these materials. In fact, what you do, it's a TGA connected to a mass spectroscopy. And <clears throat> this is here a muxine, TR3C2, prepared from HF aging with a conventional muxine with fluorine uh, terminating muxine. So you can see that here, up to 800 Celsius degree, you have a water departure and you see OH groups here on the surface. Our muxine from molten salt, still you see water departure here. Intensity of a two, a two different peaks is a bit different, but there is no OH peak. However, we see a slight gassing of CO2, so it seems that we oxidize a bit the carbon. And the, uh, the conclusion of this slide is that our molten salt muxine does not contain OH group, only oxygen, and only chlorine terminated. So there is no fluorine, no OH. And then we did some elect the electrochemistry, uh, electrochemical characterization of these materials in lithium ion battery electrolyte, an IPF6 in ECDMC electrolyte. So this is first a conventional mixine prepared from HFHC. In uh, what we call LP30 electrolyte, in this LIPF6 uh, carbonate-based electrolyte, what you see is that you have for this HF prepared vaccine uh, a second cell lithium intercalation with different redox peaks. The position of the peaks depends on the slit size of uh, the vaccine. However, you can see that you this redox or this lithium intercalation occurs over a wide, large range of potential. So it means that this is not even a good anode, not even a good cathode, because for negative electrode, you need to keep the potential as low as possible and for the positive as high as possible. However, here it's not clear whether it's an anode or a cathode. The electrochemical signature of our fluorine-free chlorine-terminated muxine is, and oxygen-terminated muxine is completely different. So our molten salt muxine saw a lithium intercalation with no redox peak. The voltage range is much narrow within two volt. The mean average voltage is 1.2 volt. And you can see that you have a huge capacity of 700 coulomb per gram. And this <clears throat> unique electrochemical signature, which is super symmetric, reminds the fast capacitive like redox, inter uh, capacitive like signature of a uh, supercapacitor of capacitive storage, which means that the lithium ion intercalation is supposed to be very fast. And indeed, this is what we uh, studied next. This is the change of the capacitance, capacity versus the cycle number at different, uh, at different C rate, a different rate of charge discharge for a conventional HF muxine. And what you can see is that <clears throat> at 10 C rate means a, a charge discharge within six minutes, you are about less of uh, I will say 50 milliampere per gram. Now, if you compare with the molten salt vaccine that we prepare, the same weight loading between the two electrodes, 1.4, 1.2, you can reach about 700 milliampere per gram at 180 C. So it means that first you start from 200 milliampere per gram at load discharge rate, which is very, which is very decent. And you can still deliver at 100 C free, uh, I would say in a six minute charge discharge, uh, 0.6 minute charge discharge, you can still discharge here 100 milliampere per gram. So this is a 36 second discharge. So this is a super high power performance for lithium intercalation in this material. So this can be, this mixing shows very uh, high power performance and also high capacity. And what we did after was to track the position of a 0, 0, 2 peak during the cycling of uh, this electrode. This is the in situ X-ray operando. So you change the potential, you, you charge, you discharge the electrode, charge, discharge, and at the same time, you record the position of a 0, 0, 2 peak. And as you can see, first, the displacing is about 11 Amstrain. And there is no real big change during the lithium intercalation. So it means that there is no briefing during the intercalation, the intercalation of lithium ion. So this value leads to an interlinear distance of about 
free hamstring. And this corresponds to the intercalation of lithium ions between the layers with very few only amount of solvent molecules. Lithium ions are intercalated with completely uh, with, uh, partially dissolved. And as you, uh, uh, as you see, this partial dissolvation here, we can observe it in redox materials, not only in porous carbon electrodes, uh, where it was responsible for capacitance increase. And this partial dissolvation in this 2D redox material seems also to explain the high power performance, the capacitive-like redox process. So this is something which is very important and interesting because this partial dissolvation uh, could be the, is mainly the reason of its high power performance. And we definitely uh, 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 could exploit this phenomenon of partial dissolution in these 2D mixing redox materials to enhance the power performance of redox storage. I will come back on this point at the end of the talk. Then what we try to do, <clears throat> we try to improve the electrochemical performance of our, our metal by doing an exfoliation of this molten salt here free to mixing. So the exfoliation of a molten salt prepare mixins are more complex than the uh, etched in aqueous electrolyte. But what we did was uh, we took our mixin, we mixed with TBAOH, a big cation, a strong base. We did sonication and uh, we did the centrifugation to recover supernatant. And what you observe is that Yes, you have a kind of delamination, exfoliation. Here, this is a, a 2.05 nanometer. It corresponds to, a, I would say, two layers of mixines. Uh, uh, but this is, I would say, not all the sample that is fully delaminated. Again, you have, uh, I would say, about 50% of a sample which is really delaminated like that. So it's more difficult to delaminate these materials. But still, when you take this material, as you can see, you still have the same electrochemical signature, symmetry. You increase the capacity and you enhance the power performance. And yes, finally, uh, you can improve further the electrochemical properties in terms of capacity and, and energy with further exfoliation of your material. But a lot of work still need to be done to, uh, to, uh, to be able to fully exfoliate, delaminate this molten salt prepare mixing. And then there is also a last uh, couple of slides, a new, uh, uh, another method which we uh, recently published. It's a 2D mixing synthesis that we have one pot method. What you do is that you start from a uh, 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 max precursor. You mix uh, uh, titanium powder, aluminum powder, carbon powder in a stoichiometric ratio. You put this uh, uh, pellet that you pr prepare by pressing on into a crucible and you put here your salt bed. When you heat, the molten salt is going to, uh, uh, your sample is going to be immersed in the molten salt and you can even keep air atmosphere, no need to control the uh, via nitrogen or argon atmosphere. And then you prepare your max phase during the first step at 1300 Celsius degree. And then you open your crucible and you add the Lewis acid etchant, copper chloride, to etch in situ the max phase that you prepared in situ during the molten salt synthesis. And then at the end, you recover your TRFC2 mixin layer uh, powder that you need to wash uh, to remove a copper. And then by doing that, this is, uh, you can in situ prepare the max followed by in situ etching of the mixin. And just to show you that uh, by doing that, you can prepare max phase in situ and then finally mixin with uh, also the same efficiency uh, still, uh, you have mixin from the XRD pattern, the exactly same electrochemical signature. And this means that, yes, definitely, uh, everything is controlled by, uh, I would say, the surface groups, which are different from molten salt electrolyte to, uh, I would say, a conventional liquid, liquid delamination from HF content. And this points out again the very important role of a partial dissolvation to get this capacitive like fast redox process uh, electrochemical signature. And then I would like to give a bit, may, maybe a, a last couple of slides about that. So this is more or less the binary view of charge storage mechanism. Here on the left side, you have what we call the double layer, electrical double layer, electrostatic charge storage by charging the double layer uh, uh, capacitance. So this is what I showed before, for porous carbon, for supercapacitors, a high surface area carbon store the charge by double layer. Here, if you take muxin in 
neutral aqueous electrolyte, you will get with a couple of ten, tens, tens of mean, maybe 50 first per gram, which is, there is no redox reaction. It's only a double layer. And you can see here, it's a very nice rectangular double layer like chalk. One over on the other extreme end of a process, you have what we call the lithium intercalation. This is, for instance, what happens in graphite, uh, like negative electrodes in lithium ion batteries, where you intercalate lithium ions fully dissolvated between the graphite layers. And then by doing that, you have full charge transfer between the lithium and the carbon, and you have a redox process with high capacity. It's a full charge transfer between, again, uh, the, the, the lithium and the, and the carbon. Here, you also have for positive electrodes, the same for LFP electrodes, LFP04, lithium ions are intercalated, fully dissolvated, and you have a full charge transfer, and you can recover the full, uh, the full capacity of uh, LFP04. So still, this is high capacity uh, during intercalation reaction of dissolvated lithium. So this process is purely electrostatic, low capacity or low capacity, limited capacitance, but very fast. And this process is purely redox, high capacity, but slow. But I would say that if you put this kind of sketch where you, it's a 2D material here, it's a host 2D material, it's a cross section. And if you put this sketch here, we, can, we could say that uh, maybe when you have this situation where the 2D layers are separated by big, large distance or separated enough, I would say, between them, you can here absorb ions fully dissolvated. However, and we are on this side of a panel. However, when you decrease the size between the 2D layers, then little by little you dissolvate more and more the ions, and you can end up to this extreme situation where, which is represented by this redox intercalation process. High capacity, low capacity, high power, limited power. And I just show you that when we have this kind of partial dissolvation in Maxine, we move from this, uh, I would say, uh, situation of double layer uh, by, uh, to this situation where we increase the capacity, but still preserve high power. And this situation could fit exactly in the middle, in this zone between these two redox, these two charge storage process. And similarly, with porous carbons, we showed a couple of years ago that when the ion size is more or less close to the pore size, you can see a set of redox peaks appearing here, but there is no former redox change of a carbon. It's just an increase of the electron transfer between the ion and the carbon. So this. <clears throat> these processes where ions are partially dissolvated between layers of 3D materials can be seen as a transition region between electro electrostatic charge rate to a full charge transfer via intercalation redox. And this is a continuum region between double layer and redox <clears throat> where the confinement of the lithium ions or the ions partially dissolvate, leads to partial dissolvation and results in an increase of ion host interactions and results in capacity enhancement uh, versus uh, uh, conventional double layer absorption, but still with super high kinetics. So this show that there are new paths to explore to prepare high power, high power delivery or high power uptake. I mean, high power batteries that can be charged within a few tens of seconds. And this is really what muxine materials uh, can do now. And this is something that needs to uh, pursue and research effort has to be directed to, toward this uh, new kind of, uh, I would say, uh, path to explore. So this is the end of my talk. I'm going to skip this part. And I would like to thank everybody for, <clears throat> for his attention, definitely, to thank my collaborators and colleagues. I'm not going to name them, but there is Pierre-Louis Taberna. <clears throat> Sorry, Pierre -Louis, Pierre Louis Taberna here. There is uh, uh, Patrick Rosier here. And uh, uh, obviously, as you can see in this picture, I'm very pleased and honored to have a Professor Hugo Gotzi for three months here as visiting the scientist. And I would like to end this talk and I would like to thank you all for your kind, kind attention and I hope I was not too long. Thank you very much for impressive presentation. Uh, now time is open for the Q&A. Uh, let me 
uh, read the first question. Uh, I wonder if the capacitance due to confinement is similarly applicable to other Vanderbilt 2D material? This is something that uh, it's a, there is a recent paper which has been published by the group of Veronica Augustine in Nature Materials on MNO2, Bernasite MNO2. And this is a 2D material. And yes, as you can see, there is this kind of uh, more switch from a capacitive like uh, a signature, which is based on redox reactions. So, yes, this all applies if this is at least applicable to other materials. And now we are trying to explore, as uh, uh, because it was a question, other materials like uh, uh, 2DMD and so on to try to see if it, we can find the same thing. But I will say that as long as you have a kind of flexible uh, something which is flexible not a rigid structure where which cannot breathe and you cannot uh, accommodate uh, solvent molecules like a graphite or whatever you want yes this uh, kind of mechanism could be uh, could operate in other materials like that thank you the second question uh, thanks for the wonderful lecture uh, maxine and grapina to the materials with the different surface characteristics how do you think of uh, making lamella like structure of the grapine and maxine would it be possible or feasible approach for enhancing lithium ion accessibility or energy capacity this is a very interesting question. I believe that in the literature, there are already other people who try to make some delamination and recombination by playing with, uh, uh, I would say, the, uh, 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 the zeta potentials by playing with a recombination, restacking a 2D structure. And now that we, that we, uh, that we, we, we more or less think that this mechanism is very important, this could be the opportunity to revisit a little bit these results and try, yes, uh, to take advantage of this recombination and this dissolvation part cell dissolution effect and this is something that definitely uh, it will be super interesting to do thank you uh, the third question uh, thank you for the great presentation professor Simon uh, what is the sensitivity of the EQCM in terms of the minimum unit of mass that can be detected Yes, sorry, I was I did not give a lot of details because it was kind of short uh, um, but this is typically few nanograms. It's like a QCM, and this is the beauty of the EQCM, is that you can really track what happens at the surface of your electrode. And you saw only, not only for high surface rare carbon, because when you put a few uh, micrograms of porous carbon, you have a high surface, but if you take single year graphene, then you can already measure weight change. So this is super sensitive, few nanograms. Okay, thank you. The another question, I wonder if there is an impact of changing the capacitance property depending on the shape of the layer or the aspect ratio. Um, depending on the shape of the layer of the aspect ratio, I'm not sure that uh, uh, I get completely the point, but uh, if uh, the question is uh, uh, the, sh the aspect ratio, the si size of the layer, if the question is deals with uh, interior distance, yeah, definitely uh, there will be a change in the capacitance property. Uh, but I think that this is more for 2D mixing. This is uh, driven also by the surface chemistry. As I show, if you remove OH group, if you replace fluorine with chlorine, you really change the electrochemistry. And I think that the most critical change will be given by the surface chemistry. Okay. The last uh, the question from the student. Uh, Thanks for the wonderful talk. I wonder if the partial uh, dissolution can occur, the reversible, the manner uh, during charging, discharging. Yeah, this is an excellent point because I maybe I was not clear enough on that. But the partial dissolution that we observed in carbon, porous carbon, was fully reversible. This is what we uh, published with Yuri 15 years ago. So obviously in Maxine materials, in these 2D materials, this is the same. This is reversible during charge mm -hmm. and discharge. So this, uh, you have a dissolvation, resolvation. So this is what is really interesting. It's not a single irreversible process, not a single shot process. Okay. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to clarify. Okay, then I have a short question. So I really enjoyed your the past the one part the meso the molt, uh, molten salt the shielded maxine synthesis. So in that case, the material is a titanium carbide. So can we extend the diverse material for uh, this type of the synthesis? Yes, for sure. I um, uh, may let me show. Yeah. So I show here. 
some uh, 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 some uh, uh, materials that we need so we can prepare titanium nitride we can prepare uh, uh, ti uh, yeah titanium nitride titanium carbide because obviously muxines are C are uh, carbide or nitride so but you can replace titanium with other materials other metals sorry there is an example with tantalum here we did also uh, uh, we did a couple of them so I don't remember exactly but yes as long you can as long as you have a max phase available uh, mm -hmm. and as long as a redox potential of your Lewis acid is higher than the redox potential of your A element, then yes, you can fully prepare these materials. You can remove zinc, you can remove aluminum, you can remove silicon and, and gallium, whatever you want. So this is a, really the beauty of this, uh, of this method, just by Gibbs energy coupling. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the kind explanation and very impressed presentation. Uh, let's thank the, our, the speaker, the Professor Patrice Simon. Thank you a lot for your, uh, thanks a lot for 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 your great uh, uh, great invitation and I was really uh, honored to be there. Great honor, thank you. Okay, so uh, I would like to the finish the, our the evening uh, session. Then I would like to thank the all the speakers and also the all audience again. And tomorrow the morning, the the last session the will start the from the nine thirty the a.m. So uh, please join us again. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.